So my name is Luciana Buriol. Before starting the talk, I would like to, to thank the invitation. Thanks to organizers for organizing this very nice workshop. I, I'm really enjoying every talk. Thank you for putting together. This is a lot of work. So I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate to be invited. Thank you a lot. I also looking forward for this afternoon. And maybe before starting, just a quick, uh, a quick note about David Johnson. Um, he was one of the reviewers of my first international paper. <laughs> and I got to know because he wrote a six page review. <laughs> he liked the paper, put a major review, and cited his paper in his book as the reference for materistics in ATSP and discussed the review with me. He, he was really great. I, I was a still a student and had this lucky in life. <laughs> so today, I will talk about the Amazon Fulfillment Network, topology and capacity planning. It's not exactly VRP, as you can see by the title, but this is a lot related because basically, um, what I will tell is how we prepare this network before the middle mile uh, um, routing, let's say. So let's just start. First, I will introduce the Amazon topology because there are different buildings, different situations. So I will describe a little bit this. Then the Amazon fulfillment network, more or less how it works. Some optimization phases that we have to design this network from the greenfield design until the execution time where packages are flowing this network. So my idea is to give, give an idea how this is planned. Um, then quickly I will describe a color, column generation that we are working for solving one specific problem in this network and then some concluding remarks. So I will start introducing the buildings. There are different kinds of buildings. The first one is the fulfillment centers. The fulfillment centers is where Amazon stores the inventory. So usually this, these buildings are huge. This one I, is BFI4, I visited recently, uh, is the closest one to Seattle. I'm working in Seattle, uh, in Bellevue in fact, but it's close to, to Seattle. It fits 15 soccer fields inside, but I heard that there are others that fit 25 soccer fields somehow, so they are really huge because they not only store the inventory, uh, they process the first step of the packages from the Amazon facilities to customers. So it is where the items are packed in a package. So there is a whole processing area for doing this to send to dif different destinations that the packages will uh, have after leaving the fulfillment center. Um, this picture is from the AR building, is Amazon Robotics. There are some buildings that uh, move inventory. Move inventory is uh, in interesting, yes, but, but we move inventory inside the building shelves in, uh, with the, these robots. So in fact, uh, there is a huge area where, for example, in this building, there are about 2,000 of these robots that move in these small items. So this fulfillment center is for what we call sortable items, small items that does not require some special uh, something to carry the item, um, associated can carry, and the items are stored in these shelves. Um, the robots move in this area, the associates are in a, a limit area where the robot moves and they follow the instructions of robots. Basically, it is how it works. Um, we have non sortable FCs, sortable FCs, non sortable. Amazon Robotics FCs, so we have different kind of inventory buildings. So the, the um, where basically our warehouses. Then the next uh, type of um, 
building is the Amazon Sortation Centers. The Amazon Sortation Centers is uh, where customer orders are sorted by final destination and they are consolidated in trucks. So basically, from the fulfillment centers, the packages are sent to sortation centers, and then packages coming from different fulfillment centers are organized to the next um, node where the packages will go. So they are going to different, the, uh, different destinations, and these destinations are organized in, to, in the sortation centers. So here, uh, we do not have storage. The packages are only moving in these buildings. Maybe in the future we will have some kind of storage, not now. Um, uh, so the, the buildings are still very large, but not as large as the, the fulfillment centers. The, the, another kind of building in this network are the delivery stations. So the delivery station where, is where customer orders are prepared for the last mile delivery to customers. So from, from there, the packages will leave with the vans to be delivered to the customer house by Amazon, by the delivery service providers that are trippy, that also uh, part of the package are delivered by them, by the Amazon Flex, that is a kind of Uber for delivering package. So there are people that use their cars and their time to deliver packages, and, and all these are in the, in the program. So we have hundreds of them in the US, um, a much higher number because um, they are also very smaller, well positioned to make this last uh, mile a route uh, as fast as possible. We also have some Amazon Air Gateway buildings that are um, um, more or less as airports, a few, a few of them. But basically what Amazon does is using the airport network of the country. Um, uh, we, right now we have about 110 aircrafts that fly to over 70 destinations around the world. Um, uh, so the aircrafts, uh, are, are filled with containers like this one that has this shape, the shape of the craft, of course, to maximize the package we can fulfill. Uh, and all these buildings are integrated in, in a network. My talk today is more focused in the truck scheduling, um, the network design for the trucks, not for the air. The air design is done by another team we take as an input, so I will be focusing more in the network used by the trucks. But the, the air gateways, the, the air points, the airports can be in any, between any of this, these buildings. We can have an, an uh, air point between FC and sortation center, between sortation centers and sortation center, between sortation center and delivery station. So the air distribution is, is mixed with this truck network. So this is, so all the buildings together, so the fulfillment centers send the package to sortation centers, which will, will organize the spectrum to destinations, and then the last mile will do the, 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 the deliver. So this is the last mile, this is the middle mile, where we also have all the inbound network, that is how all this, these items arrive to the Amazon network. So we have the global vendors, the domestic, domestic vendors that send big chunk of items to the inbound cross docks where these amounts are partitioned in, uh, in in amounts that are sent to the fulfillment centers and then organizing this inventory across the different buildings. So this network is then mostly operated by trucks and planes inside the country, by ships with the global vendors, for example, as you can imagine, there are many, many items that come from Asia. Um, and um, the ones, in, this, in the last mile. 
So today I will focus in this network. This is the, what I'm calling the Amazon Fulfillment Network. It's from the fulfillment centers where items are stored until the delivery stations where the last mile will we start. So I will focus in this part. How we design this network. This network is very dynamic because it's, no, it's not that we build an, a physical structure, it's the roads that we use to transport items. But we do not link every pair of building. We need to decide which pair of buildings we will have a lane and in this lane, we are expecting to have a high flow so we can better utilize the trucks that will be using there. We, we have trucks living several times per day, so we have to organize all this on the uh, most optimized way. So the idea is to describe a little bit this process. Um, first of all, how do we plan the, the nodes are di is different from how we plan the buildings. So the nodes are huge. So this is a decision that is taking years in advance. Uh, and the decision, let's summarize as where to build, which kind of building to build. It will be an Amazon Robotics sortation center, non-sortation center. Um, uh, so, so, sorry, it will be for sortable items, non-sortable items. So which kind of building? and which size. So basically, these are the main decisions we have to take when, uh, when deciding where to, to build this structure. And there are other decisions, for example, as uh, you can imagine, it's not that Amazon buy a land and start building right, uh, right after. Land, land is bought in advance. So we have this decision taken already already and we need to decide we will use one of these lands that were procured in advance or we will buy other area for some special reason and we will start buying uh, building there. Usually also it's not only one building, it's a few buildings, how many, in what time to start each one. So the facility location problems that are solved for Deciding where to build, is they are very complicated and very interesting because it involves a lot of data that has a, already a lot of um, unknown information before deciding. Um, delivery stations instead, they are much smaller, so they can be built on months in advance. Sometimes they can even be bought because these buildings uh, uh, can be used from, can be bought and then use it as delivery station. So the decision is a little bit different, but on the other side, they are in more quantity, there is more dynamicity there, it's another complicated facility location problem. The capacity that we have in the buildings, let's summarize that the main ones is labor. So we have to know exactly the capacity we have in labor in every hour of every day. Um, and if I, I could speak for one hour just about this, because also inside the buildings, uh, the capacity is different in the different sectors. So to everything, all sectors to work properly, this has to be synchronized. So these problems are, are also very interesting. Uh, and also the mechanical capacity, you have some limitations that you will have, for example, of course, this is the, 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 the dock, usually the number of docks is, is many, many, many more. This is an example, but let's say we have a limitation on the number of trucks that can be loading and unloading on the same time. We have other kind of uh, um, mechanical limitations that we are always very close to. So we have to use these resources very well. Um, about the track lanes, that is where I will spend um, more time now, is how we decide then that given that we have the buildings, how we will connect the thing. You can think they are connected already because we have these lanes, but this is revised every, every day, every day, every 
I will detail you a little bit. So long-term planning, medium-term planning, short-term planning. So this, in the long-term planning, this network is revised at months in advance. Let, let's say between three and six months in advance, this is being revisited to un, and recreated the, lay, the, the network from scratch uh, based on rules. Of course, the rules are fixed. They do not change much, so we will create a new network that ha will have some relation to the previous one, but also some difference with the previous one. And this is created what, from what we call Greenfield from zero. We start an, a network again. Of course, later we will somehow converge to things that we have. It will be almost a learning um, path here. So we have other decisions in, in a medium-term plan. We will adjust this network that we are creating months before with a lot of uncertainty. As you can imagine, if I will plan the network for in six months, many things can change. So I, I need to revise and, and update that network. So we will have better forecasts, better information of what is happening. So including all the, 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 the data that there's so many different data that are considered when modeling. Uh, and we will have more accuracy if we are closer. So we will revise that network. And then when we are even closer, in this process, the revision in the beginning will be mostly about uh, which will be the lanes that maybe we will deprecate, we will not use, maybe we will have new lanes, but getting closer, we will decide about the capacity of that lane. So let's adjust the capacity better and better. So we still can adjust capacity one week ahead because there are so many different systems for the middle mile transportation that we can add capacity or remove capacity in some links where capacity will be one more truck, one less truck. So we have some uh, dynamicity that we can use closer to execution. And when we are at a time of executing, let's say sending the package, we are now talking about a different granularity. We know the inventory that we are carrying. Before, in the beginning, we have a demand. Now, in execution, we, have, we know exactly the inventory, how much it weights, how, which is the volume, what kind of inventory it is. And then we route this chunk of uh, items in a wind of time. Um, to, and, and in fact, when we are at an execution time, we run this every 15 minutes. And what we are using at that time, since we cannot change capacity anymore, we not, can change the network design. At the, that point, we use the dual variables of these models to give us a, a sensor of how the resources utilization is and we still make decisions with this information. For example, in um, changing costs of the networks at that point, and changing costs, we can change decisions on route that packages will take. So it's really a beautiful process, in fact. And in every stage that I'm describing, even the problem is still very similar. The data is different, and then we use different solution approaches. Because in, in some stage, we will need some characteristics, and we need some solution approach. In other stage, we need other. So what I will do, I will tell one story about one solution approach. And I'm very glad to introduce my friend, my colleague, uh, uh, Yufei Wang who has been working with this problem since the beginning and is still working a lot. He knows all the details. I will tell him the story, but he knows all the details about this. And it, it, it has some more constraints 
than what I would uh, describe because to make it short, I would describe more or less the core of this system, but there are other constraints involved. Wei Hong, she's a, a scientist, colleague of us, who has a, lo a lot of experience at Amazon. Vinicius Lott was with us for a while. He has a huge experience in column generation and algorithm design, which is very important for making this um, software is very fast. Pelagie was a, she is a PhD student in Berkeley. She spent three months with us last year and she was part of the project in one specific part of it. Myself and there, there are more. Uh, it's a, um, a team of uh, software developers and engineers that, that help us to make this, this work. The problem that I will describe is how do we decide uh, which lanes to deprecate? So close it to execution a few weeks before. Maybe we don't need all that, those lanes, that network that we have that at that point. We can still deprecate some lanes. So the column generation that, we, uh, that I will propose is to decide which lanes to deprecate. Um, so we have the network topology already that it was planned before. We just needed to adjust. Okay, from this network, let's remove a few links. We will still be able to route. We will save costs. And this is what is about what I will summarize very uh, fast here. So the goal is to identify lanes that can be deprecated. We have the network topology. We have an OD demand matrix. So from origins to destinations, which is the amount of the demand that we are expecting to send. We have, in fact, millions of transportation paths. We have predefined paths. We can generate new ones, but we, we, we use these predefined ones uh, uh, as a start. And we minimize costs when flow is sent in this network. This is a linear programming. We are at this stage not solving an integer programming. We just want to, to route this flow. Maybe one last thing. We first com computed the flow plane. And later, with the flow plane, we decide which lanes to deprecate. Just to have a high view of this structure, the FCs, they only have links to the other buildings. We can have direct links from FCs to delivery stations or FCs to sortation centers. And the sortation centers can link each other. And then here in this middle part of this network, we can have loops. And then from these nodes, we can only have uh, ending the, uh, links to the delivery stations, just to have a view how this network looks like. But in fact, uh, since we, we, we have to optimize for costs, but we also have to have a speed on mind. A speed here, I, I mean the time for delivering packages, one day, two day, is what we get when we buy something. You will receive this in a certain day. We call this a speed. So we really work with a speed, speed seriously, planning uh, time a lot. And then instead of using that topological structure, we use that, top, that topological structure with a time information in the network. Basically, what we do is, so this is a topological, very simple network. Let's say this is an FC fulfillment, fulfillment center, sortation center, delivery station. Very simple one. So we have trucks leaving at 9 a.m., 1 p.m. In, in direction to this build, and other uh, trucks leaving at this time here. The transit time for this link is two hours, five hours for this one. So what we do, we add this topological information, this time and space graph. In other words, this time annotation in links became part of the topology. So in this time information, we add nodes. Every time we have a truck leaving or arriving a node, all nodes on the same um, horizontal line here are nodes related to this node, but marking different 
um, events happening in this network. So the inclined arcs represent trips. The horizontal arcs represent waiting time in this building. Um, and for example, here in green, this can be a possible route. We, uh, we can leave 9 a.m. From, from a fulfillment center, arrive in the sortation center 11 a.m. Then the, 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 the demand will be sitting there until 8 p.m. And then there is a last trip here 1 a.m. So we, we have here two days, one day, today, but we are planning this for a longer time horizon. So the time horizon is very important to us because we have to, to take this time into account in, in this period and also for many days. Um, so the original no uh, graph has about 1,000, a little bit more than 1,000 nodes, 10,000 arcs. And the time space graph, as you could see, it grows a lot because of the, the, the events. It has about 100,000 uh, nodes, a million arcs. Also, we have, we have many, many arcs because Besides the Amazon topology, we have the three party delivers. So we have all those arcs between origin and destination direct arcs that will represent the different three par parties that deliver to us that have different costs. So we, ha we have different uh, links between the same pair of nodes. Um, <laughs> I will summarize as the following. Uh, we are using a path, a basic path flow formulation. See, this is a link flow formulation that we are not using because since we have the information of the path, we need an extra index to represent the path. And then this formulation is, has many uh, uh, constraints, many variables. The path fl flow formulation has an index for the path. Basically, we make we make sure that all the OD pairs are sent, represented by K, K. All the capacity for all arcs are respected, and also some capacities for the nodes. We also tested that three formulation. Instead of a link variable associated to links, instead of variables associated to paths, we were associating link uh, variables to tricks, but this formulation was highly degenerated and we returned to the path flow formulation where we implemented the column generation. I will go a little bit faster, just summarize a little bit. So basically we speed up this column generation in different ways. The first one that was talked a lot yesterday, I was very happy to hear about re re running the same problem repeatedly with a, a slightly different uh, in, uh, in different data. It is what we do. We run these problems repeatedly. For example, this column generation is, is run uh, at least once a week. There are other problems that, uh, that we run every 15 minutes. So we run this repeatedly. We can use information. So we can start our columns with the columns that were used from the previous uh, run as a a warm start to, to, to take advantage of this, let's say. Um, so we add many columns per iteration, about 100,000, because of we have more than 2 million OD pairs, and we can have more than one path between OD pair, meaning that from origin to a destination, we can send flow to using different paths, part of the flow in one part of the more than two also. Um, and one thing that is, it was very nice, it was Vinicius who, who worked uh, with us in this. He added a lot of um, algorithm engineering in this work. For example, how can we compute this faster? Because in every iteration of this column generation, we have to insert all these columns. The columns are shortest paths between origins and destinations. How to compute this very fast? So he did a preprocessing that I will describe quickly, but it's really worthwhile. So he, ran, he did a preprocessing between every pair of origin destinations we, be, uh, we run a, a, a forward search from the origin, a backward search from the destination, 
and only arcs that are in both the surges can be in one path between the duration destination. So because of the time information of the time space graph, for example, this arc, this arc is linking the 9 a.m. of the next day. This is after the deadline for this deliver. So of course, this link cannot be in any path between this path. Doing this, we have small subgraphs between every pair, and while running the column generation in every iteration, every time we compute to a test path, we are changing the duals, but the topology is the same. So we always use this subset of, of graphs to compute. Also, this graph is a DAG. Uh, because of the time information, it ended up being a DAG. So in the shortest path is also not a dextra. We can run a, a, modifi a, a topological sorting and compute the shortest path with the in linear time. So with that, computation was speeded up a lot. Uh, we, we are solving this problem in about 30 minutes when we are only using node capacity. We have different runs. With some, we have to have link capacity. Some others, we are more free about link. If we, we use also arc, arc capacity, so we take a little bit longer. But it's still, for us, in, 50, in one hour, being 40% of the optimum solution uh, with a gap. Maybe we are closer. This is very good. So I will, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm late. <laughs> late. Um, I will just summarize. I don't want to take m most of the time. Just say that another thing we are doing that Pelagie, the summer student, did was learning the demands that use shortest paths in sequential solutions. And then we fix part of the demand using shortest paths to about 50% of the demand. We fix that, and then we solve the column generation for the remaining variables. This is speeded up a lot, too. Of course, that fixing some variables in advance, we will not have the optimal solution anymore. So we, we tested different percentages of the demand that we are fixing. The better trade-off that we found was fixing 50% of the demand to the shortest paths, and we are still less than 1% close to the optimal solution. So it was a good trade-off. Um, there is also, after we computed this flow plane, we can then fix the arcs that has a very thin flow as not used. We are going to deprecate these arcs, and then rerun this column generation without these arcs, and um, so reorganize this flow. So, uh, so as a, con a concluding remarks, we are working with la large scale optimization. We have different kind of approach uh, in different phases that we are solving in, this, uh, in the complete network design that we solve. Uh, we combine optimization with a lot of algorithm engineering, with machine learning to help us to speed up uh, some of these computations. We, with heuristics together, it's a little bit, a bit of everything together to help to make this fast. Um, and also problems are coming from different uh, uh, problem families. I described a little bit more in the network design but there are other problems related why we are solving this. So there are several things linked together to, to solve these problems. And it demands a lot of internal collaboration. Glad I have. We have a good collaboration. I'm glad to have Yufei here. Yufei is working remotely, but we are both working in Seattle uh, in this problem. So that, that was it. I'm done.
you wait for the demands to arrive and then you make this decision? This one that I'm describing is demand forecast. Uh, we have different demand forecasts for different phases. In this phase, we, we have one, of course, that is being proved over time. It, it is very good. But when we are closer to execution, there, are, there is a point that we are already using some purchases that were done and also some forecasts for hours and a few days later. Because when we buy something, that time that you receive uh, is a promise. We will work with that promise. But once we promise, we start working uh, in a different plane that maybe will be faster and cheaper. Because for giving an answer faster, we cannot really ex uh, check all the possibilities. We check a few possibilities and give an answer back, and then we will improve afterwards. So in that point, we are using some uh, already data, real data, not only forecast, but always with some forecast for the next hours and, and days. The, the second question is the drop seekers. Who uses Amazon as a marketplace? Are they the part of the network or they are not in the network? Oh, they're three party? Are they part of the network? Yes, sorry, I didn't design here because the, the graph with the direct links was a little bit unclear. But between every origin and destination, we have three parties direct hearts, not using the network, of course, because we do this planning considering also the three people the 3P um, demand. These multi-commodity flow problems, they were used, or the, the multiplicative weight updates method was very successfully used on large-scale multi-commodity flow problems. Did you ever try that to get good solutions quickly? To uh, wait? Uh, Multi, uh, multiplicative weight updates, so mm -hmm. that you have some cost function on the resources that grows exponentially. Mm -hmm. um, and there are very, you get in very short time very good approximate solutions. Um, not, I'm, I'm not getting well if you are saying about a, a solution approach or, or? Yes, it's a solution approach for solving multi commodity flow problems. So, which solution approach? The, the multiplicative weight update method. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Like yes, rates, yes, there is another group. Yes. They are being used to closer to execution, not at this point. Um, in this point, we are aggregating demand between origin destination. And then, um, I, I, I do not remember exactly, the, I do not know even, I can share this, much, but I know that the MPC is being used more to the problem closer to execution, maybe because we need the individual shipments, not the aggregation. I think this is the reason. Because there they use every shipment. So thank you, sir.